and 80% of that oil, 80% of the homes in, in Maine are, use heating oil to keep themselves warm in the winter. Of that, about 80% of it comes fr- from Newfoundland, not from overseas, from Venezuela or Saudi Arabia or anything like that. So the, the, the problem with wind is that wind will change the amount of, of speed depending on from 7 to approximately about 18 miles an hour. That's the most effective speed for wind to be at in order to turn the blades and to turn the turbine and produce electricity. Once you get above 20 miles an hour, it's too fast, and they have to shut them down. And once you're below 7 uh, miles an hour, it's too slow to keep the turbine blades turning. So it's an intricate balance of what would be actually useful. Correct. But your main tenant with wind so far is it's too expensive and it's not efficient enough. Is that what you're saying? It has no efficiency whatsoever to the grid because it will provide electricity only to the grid when the wind is within that speed between 7 and, say, 18 or 20 miles an hour. So because that wind speed can vary minute to minute, day to day, year to, you know, year over year. It, and it's like buying a luxury automobile and going outside and, and trying to turn the engine on only when, you know, the wind is 7 to 20 miles an hour. It will only run then. And no modern economy can base itself on such an uh, erratic source of power. So why do you think people in high places and heads of industry and political people are so deeply entrenched in wind? What is it? It's our money they're taking from us. They love the money. And they're, they're kind of bought to the idea that by being on wind, it will produce electricity, which can be stored somewhere, which there's no technology for us to do that right now, which then could be used to reduce hydrocarbon dependence or hydrocarbon use. And every European country that has tried this approach their natural gas and coal use actually increased rather than decreased because you have to keep these electric power plants that are based on coal, natural gas, or oil running as stand-up reserve in case the wind dies, which it can from second to second. Okay, I get that. So they have to keep these coal and gas fire plants turning on standby reserve in order to pick up the slack on the second that wind power dies. And it's really difficult to manage that grid problem because you can't, you know, uh, say a natural gas plant is located in one place and the wind turbines are located on top of a mountain and the wind dies, you know, over a 30-minute or even a 15-minute period, you've got to immediately ramp up the, the, say, natural gas plant in order to pick up the lack of power coming down the, from the mountain, from the wind turbines. You know, this information is like taking the wind out of their sails. Absolutely. And the only way to make this work uh, financially is through government subsidies. And what does that mean, really? What does that translate as? People hear the word government subsidies, but what does that mean? Okay, right now that means because we're running deficits, that means that we're adding to the deficit, which adds to our uh, debt load, which increases the ability, decreases the ability for Maine to be competitive or even the United States to be competitive worldwide and increases the cost for every business trying to do business and get loans in order to start a new business. So government subsidies actually are a, the wrong way for us to go. We should go much more toward you know, private enterprise and less government interference. Now, the government subsidies itself, uh, for instance, let me just put it this way. For, for a typical plant system in, the United, in Maine, say 20 turbines on a mountaintop, it would cost $2.5 million to put these things up on the mountaintop, not including the amount of roads or transmission lines you have to put up also to get to that mountaintop, about $2.5 million per turbine. So you put up 20 turbines, that's $50 million. The day they turn on the power to that particular wind turbine farm, the owner or developer of that particular site gets a 30% grant from the federal government. It used to be in the form of tax credits. Now it's a, it's a cash payment. So that's $15 million, boom, right up front. Now, additionally to that, they get a $0.13 cents a kilowatt renewable energy credit, cash or credit they can use to sell on the market. Plus they get the... So for 
every kilowatt they produce, they, they get 13 cents also, cash out of the pockets of taxpayers. So every, but right now, of course, the, the federal government is running deficits, so we're adding to our debt by producing wind power. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. It's depressing. It's the wrong way to go. Why are people so attracted to it? I guess there's this notion of saving the planet, saving energy, saving money. There's this assumption of all of that with wind. I know in my perception, I've always felt that. I always thought that. I assumed it. Let me put it to you that way. I assumed it with no understanding the details. Okay. The, the major assumption or the major um, the proponents of wind power use the following phrases. In other words, they want to increase jobs, green jobs specifically, right? Increase, we'll have green jobs, and that will get us over the hump, and we'll be better off. I've it'll heard decrease, that. It'll decrease foreign fossil fuel use. In other words, get energy, energy independence. Right. And it's greener because, you know, it doesn't burn hot fossil fuel. So our, our CO2 emissions will be reduced, and green... Therefore, global warming will be nullified. Well, just so you know, I did a show on CO2 and talked to a scientist who's worked his entire life on this. Yep. In my findings, in my findings on this show and the many hours of due diligence I did on CO2, yep. this is food for plants. It's absolutely. This is, yep. you know, nutrients for life. Yep. So it's like the series of assumptions. If you don't get into the detail and you separate apples from oranges and really get clear what is what, then you just assume that everything in the conversation and in the matrix of everything green is appropriate and is going to reach this economy of scale and stimulate business and produce all this stuff. I mean, that's the conversation that's being had. I assumed it myself as well. But speak more about... The aggregate demand and stimulating the economy, you're just getting onto that. Okay, well, let me, let's, let's just finish up on CO2 for a minute, if you don't mind. No, go ahead. There are so many misunderstandings about what CO2 is and, and what actually happens. Um, here, here's, a, here's a question for you. What percentage of the entire contribution to the global atmosphere is, C, is mankind's contribution to CO2? What percentage? I have no idea. Totally. Well, it's 4%. The U.S. contribution itself is only 1%. All the rest are natural sources of, of CO2 emissions. How did you get that distilled information? Um, I do a lot of reading. <laughs> In other words, where did I get it? Yeah, or how Google could... that. Google, just Google what percentage um, is mankind's contribution to CO2, and the answer will come up. That's a great question. Okay, so 96% of every all CO2 emissions annually come from natural sources. Only 4% mankind cost, and only 1% is U.S. contribution itself. Okay? One of these statistics that these people put out all the time is, you know, U.S. represents only 4% of the world population, yet we, we use 17% of the world's energy or hydrocarbons, right? And therefore, mankind has to be a source of major pollution, which is just wrong. Um, but the other, the other stupid statistic they forget is the United States produces 45% of the world's GDP. So our efficiency is huge compared to the rest of the world. Anyway, 4% is the mankind's contribution. 1% is U.S. So here's the next one. What contribution does CO2 have to the greenhouse effect? In other words, is CO2 a major cause of greenhouse effect? The answer to that is no. Water vapor is the largest contributor to the greenhouse effect, amounting to almost 98%. CO2 is only 0.11% of the total of the contribution. Can that be verified? Yes. Okay. Next is, um, <clears throat> what, here's a more fundamental question than that. Answer this. What's the largest, what's the most common gas in the atmosphere where you and I breathe every day? What's the most common gas? Oxygen. Wrong. Nitrogen. So much for my science details. <laughs> 78%. I, I've just been fired from my science class. <laughs> All right. It, Ladies and gentlemen.